go a little bit about details about some of the things you have done mm-hmm. also uh, you have made brilliant contributions to steels welding crystallography phase transformations in general and then the super bainite and also the neural network application to materials and this is actually kind of looking back from where we are right now you are far ahead in that call the data science and engineering also and so you you can pick any one of the topic and then kind of walk us through the innovation cycle how does how do you stumble on how do you pick up and take it to the next level because this yeah. uh, many times we don't and un- many people don't understand that so yeah so so i'll take the example of the neural network so i was attending an american welding society meeting in florida you know debroy was there and uh, all the usual people and someone presented a talk on neural networks i didn't understand it okay and furthermore um conferences these days don't actually allow for real discussion you know apart from things like the golden conference so i came back to cambridge and i bought a book on the subject i still couldn't understand it so i, <laughs> I went to darwin college for lunch and i was mourning that look uh, conferences aren't what they used to be uh, and uh, books are not what they used to be and sitting right next to me was uh, a young guy called david mckay who turned out to be one of the world's leading experts on in- information theory so we hit it off and we watched lots of uh, so um he helped me with neural networks to really go deeply into neural networks but it's a totally different language that he would speak because his level of mathematics was far above mine but it was all lubricated because we watched many bond movies and jackie chan movies and had dinners together we went on protest marches against the war uh, and so on so over a period of uh, something like 24 years we worked we worked together very well whenever time allowed and you know uh, the first encounters were before the our department was connected to the internet so i would cycle over to the cavendish with a desk and load it up and then cycle back to the department that sort of stuff but i tell you the motivation was the motivation from my point of view was that whereas we could go quite far in calculating structure the engineer is not frankly interested okay they are interested in what properties the structure delivers and there wasn't an important connection between these two because the complexity of the problem is enormous you know you can't just take precipitation hardening theory and so forth and so on to you can't even calculate an elementary tensile test you know the full curve neural networks is a breakthrough in that sense the more complex the problem you know the better really and it it is remarkable that when you combine these you can actually design new alloy systems in a short period of time and one example is uh, the nickel base alloy which uh, we designed for uh, steam temperatures of 750 degrees centigrade unheard of okay uh, but of course nickel is very expensive so this has to be a very cheap alloy so by combining you know thermodynamics kinetics neural networks we came up with an alloy design without doing any experiments and it worked the first time okay uh, it doesn't necessarily it does not always the case okay uh, but in this case it worked the first time and we call this alloy ft 750 dc 750 for the steam temperature ft is frank tonkre the postdoc who did the work and dc for dirt cheap okay <laughs> <laughs> so so we designed it so that it would be affordable you know that's amazing so that shows the innovation cycle of how do you take a particular topic through collaboration also mm. so i that takes us to the one of the areas which i'd like to personally ask your question so i still remember you wrote this classic paper called unresolved issues in bainite and also in phase transformations i still remember i still have it in my one of my uh, one two So um what are the some unresolved issues with reference to steels iron which still exist and if you can give a marching orders to younger generation who are walking into the steel uh, what would be the future researchers can tackle what are the unresolved issues yes. so this is uh, one of those questions 
that is impossible to answer because if I could predict the future, yeah, then uh, uh, I don't know what I would do, but uh, it's not possible to do that. The only way, so this is not a subject for the faint hearted because there is an enormous amount of good knowledge that exists in this area. So you have to do that yourself. You have to identify a topic and to go into it deeply before starting the research. Now in the humanities subjects, PhD students actually have to propose a topic before they get funding, right? Sciences have become corrupted in that sense that you, know, you or I would find the money for a PhD student and in getting that money, nine times out of 10, you would be fixed on the project, yeah? So a student has to come and do that project. So there is an element of creativity is lost in that. So I, I would uh, encourage, you know, uh, studentships in which the student has to actually produce a proposal before they are accepted, a detailed proposal based on uh, critical thinking. I completely agree with you. And in fact, so I uh, take your message many times. I tell them to my students, dig deeper. So for last Christmas, they gave me a shovel with a signature and everything. <laughs> <laughs> to dig deeper, okay. I can show it to you here. It's good know. students, okay? Yeah, yeah, you can see that. So there it is. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> I don't see any dirt on it though, okay. <laughs> no, I haven't dug deeper in yet. So. Right. so having said that, so I think that is a clear message to, um, it is more about digging deeper and then understanding where the gap exists and then right. devoting your life to uh, make sure that you have a tangible impact on that gap. And uh, you then you build on the, like a standing on the shoulders of the uh, masters before us. So um, one of the things uh, which I'll take it to the next one, we talked about book already and also, there is a one area you, I would like you to touch upon is that when you did all those things, how did you take it to the world, like working with the industries? And also when you're going through that also, how did you bridge the gap of cultural gap and also the different countries? So kind of share us that aspect also. So in initially um, um, I didn't have any connections with industry. But uh, one day in the coffee room, uh, there was a guy called uh, Lars Eric Swenson who had come to work with Paul Howell, okay? uh, who was in the electron microscopy team. But Paul Howell went away to Penn State University. So he started talking to me and he said, look, um, uh, would you like to work on welding? Because after leaving Chalmers University, I'm going to go to ESAB. And of course, you know, foolishly, I said, how, how complicated can welding be, okay? I accepted and then we started working together. And that's how the entire work uh, sponsored partly by ESAB and by others on welding started. And of course, other people who work on welding then got interested, for example, Parsons, uh, the steam turbine generators and, and so on and so on, uh, because they could see an advantage in doing some design philosophy in this and some predictions and calculations validated by experiments and so on. So the industrial connection grew quite rapidly and uh, British Steel of course uh, also helped and people were coming from industry as PhD students. So the first Japanese person we had in the group, you might remember, uh, Manabu Takahashi, he came from uh, Nippon Steel and all those connections grew quite rapidly, simply from uh, reputation, I suppose, of what was achieved by the other students. Then we had some massive projects, you know, uh, with Japan um, covering uh, something like 50 man years of work uh, sponsored by the Japan Research and Development Corporation, um, working on uh, nickel-based super alloys and on steels. That went extremely well. Um, but of course, all of these things last for certain periods and that lasted for approximately seven years. And um, in terms of academic collaborations, I had a very strong collaboration with uh, MIT in the very early days with uh, Maurice Cohen and Greg Olson. And uh, we published uh, a couple of papers together, you know, 
and I, I call it uh, I call those papers, you know, strange couplings. Okay, <laughs> because we were trying to see whether we can explain things with a combination of diffusion and displacement. I think uh, it was very worthwhile because I don't think we can explain that. I remember talking to Christian about this uh, and explaining why we were doing this, just to show that it doesn't make sense, yeah? because the whole thing would collapse towards para equilibrium. Uh, and uh, I had a collaboration with the uh, Naval Research Laboratories uh, and with um, uh, North, North uh, Western University where Greg went and to a small extent with uh, Colorado School of Mines as well. Uh, so those were the days in which I had a lot of US collaborations, almost none in Europe, all right? Uh, and then uh, the European Union happened and I had lots and lots of students from France, for example, and it started with a, a random encounter with Roland Tayard, who is a professor at Lille University. And he said, look, uh, you know, French engineers have to do a project. Can we send them? So we had a whole string of uh, uh, French engineers who then stayed on to do PhDs with me. Uh, so that was the European connection. Uh, India, of course, uh, from the very beginning, uh, from the Cambridge Commonwealth Trust scholarships and also some connections with uh, Pakistan. And uh, later on in 2005 was a very big collaboration with uh, POSTEC in South Korea. Where we started with a blank sheet. We had to create a graduate institute of Paris technology. No building, no equipment, no people. Plenty of money, okay. <laughs> so. Within three years, we had a fantastic building, you know, with a blast furnace as its entrance, a glass blast furnace as its entrance, a giant anvil uh, pattern, lots of students and lots of equipment. And I stayed there for 10 years. And the reason for leaving was um, when I went there, I trained every, all of my stu <coughs> students to play squash. Okay. Uh, and I would beat them, beat all of them. After 10 years, I was getting beaten. So I thought, you know, this is typical Korean, okay? <laughs> to take something and to do it better, so I better leave now. So I stopped in uh, 2015. But we did a huge amount of work, actually. So Harry, that takes to the, la the recent book you wrote. In that, you articulate that innovations in materials can be accessible to anyone. And uh, so you're reducing that uh, entry to the barrier, uh, the barrier to entry, or what I would call it activation and energy. In fact, you're making it so easy to anyone to pick up material science research. You wrote this book with Professor Debray. Can you kind of cap up the professional development with that book, please? Yeah, so, so actually this was completely Debray's idea. Okay. And uh, he had read a book uh, called uh, Letters to the Young Chemist, in which uh, somebody wrote a book, beautiful letters explaining a particular problem, which young people could help to solve. So our goal was to do that, actually, in the context of everyday engineering materials. So the, uh, these days in science, uh, there's too much noise. You know, if you look at graphene, there's about 1.1 million papers published and almost nothing achieved. So uh, the point is uh, we make innovations which actually change the quality of life when we talk about uh, so-called ordinary materials, you know, uh, not just steels, but uh, silicon, for example. You know, if you can change the process of making silicon, you would cut the scrap from single crystals by an enormous amount. Uh, diamonds, uh, the artificial diamonds, and so on, uh, and so on. So we chose topics uh, which which uh, would illustrate basically that look the everyday engineering materials which you use in large quantities, and everyone has them in their hand. Okay, there is a lot of innovation associated with that, and we included a couple of maverick chapters. Yeah. So, for example, high entropy alloys, you know, nothing, nothing uh, applicable has been achieved, right? But it is an interesting concept and 
if people can focus on scaling up and finding an application which can afford those alloys, then they would be extremely useful. You know, uh, that, that was the goal of it, goal of that book. And it turns out, you know, the hard copy is really nice. I know you've got the electronic copy, but you need so, to hold this in your hands, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> not to hurry, but I, it's still not available uh, for us to buy it. Uh, it's, it's available. Okay. I would I would buy it. So I have it in my iPad. I yeah, I know you bought the electronic version. Harry, uh, we are going into some of the membership into societies which had relevance to your career. So the question is, you have a you've been a member of many professional societies. Can you share how these societies played a very vital role in your career and also the dissemination of steel metallurgy to citizens of the world? Yeah, so, so the Institute of Materials, uh, it, it used to be called the Institute of Metals in, in London. Uh, I became a books editor for that. And um, it emphasized to me the importance of actually books. Uh, and I was actually a member from the age of 16. That was the minimum age at which you could become a member. Actually, the people who interviewed me did not know that there was a minimum age, okay? But the aim of becoming a member was to get books at a 40% discount. Okay. <laughs> so, so later on, I actually became the books editor and commissioned many books for the Institute of Materials. And it was eventually taken over by Maney and uh, Taylor and Francis, uh, still published by the uh, Institute, but run by Taylor and Francis. So in that sense, the IOM was uh, extremely important. And when... Uh, on one night in uh, Graz in Austria, Deb Roy, Stan David and myself were complaining about the American Welding Journal taking so long, you know, three years to actually complete a paper review. Uh, we decided to create our own journal and I approached the Institute of Materials and immediately they agreed to publish Science and Technology of Welding and Joining, which now is probably, uh, you know, a quarter century in publishing and the, the elite journal in, in the subject. And it has brought forward the other welding journals. Because if you follow the, uh, you know, the significance of the journals, uh, after we created that journal, it stimulated the others to do a better job, okay? So from a point of view of met metallurgy and the well-being of the subject, the Institute has been very good uh, in promoting that. And I suppose, that's the goal of you know, AIME and TMS and all the rest of it, that they are there to promote the subject more than anything else uh, in the interests of the members. When I was a reader, uh, Honeycomb approached me and said, look, uh, I want to nominate you for the fellowship of the Royal Society and it requires a number of people to do the nomination, but he, he handled it all, all himself. And it came out of the blue as far as I was concerned. And he nominated me and I was actually elected a fellow before I became a professor. You know, so that's like in the very old days, you know, uh, people were readers and still fellows of the Royal Society. Nowadays, uh, probably that would not be the case. Uh, and then um, David West, uh, who wrote the book on ternary phase diagrams, he nominated me for the Royal Academy of Engineering. So that's how those two came about. And uh, people at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore uh, nominated me for the National Academy of Engineering in India and, and so on. And this particular badge that I'm wearing is uh, honorary membership of the Iron and Steel Institute of Japan, wow. which uh, Toshi Koseki of uh, Tokyo University did the nomination. None of these I asked for, but they were kind enough to contact me and uh, do, do the work associated with the nomination. So when I, it comes to my turn to nominate people, I do it very quickly. You know, I don't uh, hesitate and so on, but I do it very quickly. And sometimes people are shocked at that, <laughs> okay? Writing references and so on are important, important things to do for other people as well. 
Anything so that's how membership of societies uh, came about. Thank you, Harry. So actually, there's a follow-up question on this. One of the things I still remember is that when we went to Institute of Materials, my first ever meeting, and one of the things you did is that you dragged me and introduced to Matt Skillard and other oh, famous wow. coaches. Yeah. And I still look up to that, uh, that networking as a young student who have no idea about seeing the stalwarts of the face transformations and everything. So how can the societies generally provide kind of this atmosphere for the students who are coming into the field from different backgrounds to excel in the steel and materials community? Right now, we have so many tools, but if you can have a magical way to look at it, how can we expand more of this? I think the students need to take initiatives, okay? Uh, you, you will find, uh, speaking from a student's point of view, uh, you would find that people are actually interested in talking to you, okay? Yeah, you know, so, so my interaction with Jack Christian began by simply writing a letter. And they are not arrogant. You know, people who are really, really good are not arrogant at all. They take you at face value and they're quite happy to discuss things with you. Uh, you know, obviously the timing and so forth has to be arranged. But what I would say is never write an email. Write an actual physical letter. That okay. is a good one. Yeah, yeah, that makes a big difference. You know, because email sending is just too easy now. Right? So if you actually want to talk to a person who has actually done the theory associated with the publication, write to them, you know, they will be delighted to actually share their knowledge. That is a very good uh, 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 kind of tip for most of the people who want to walk into that. And that is the, like I call it mentor-mentee relationship and uh, how that happens. That's great, Harry, thank you. And I still remember that I did follow up one day with Matt Sled after interviews. I still believe I was in Sweden. He walked with me all the way from the university to where I was staying. And that walk, I still remember in my dreams too. Well, I think he lent you his swimming trunks, didn't he? No. <laughs> <laughs> didn't you go swimming? No, 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 no. I just walked, we were walking. Ah, okay, okay. I thought you went swimming together. Yeah. No, 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 no. I just walked from the university to where I was mm. staying. But that walk was very good. I still remember one of the words he said that, don't you ever give up working on steel metallurgy? Excellent. Yeah. I still remember that. Well, he, of course, he, of course, is a, a superstar. Uh, you know, there is nowhere now that you do not find thermocalc, for example. Okay. That's great. So coming along that walking, and I still remember my walks with you from uh, Department of Metallurgy to Darwin College, curry dinners. So that takes us to a little bit of mentoring side of it also, and also being a parent also. So you're very close to your daughters and can you sh share some of your thoughts as a dad? Yeah, so obviously not a very good <laughs> dad, okay? But in spite of that, uh, they have turned out to be really super human beings and very kind, generous, uh, and just delightful characters. So obviously they're not uh, young now. You know, well, well, I mustn't say that, okay? They're not old now, <laughs> okay? Uh, uh, so I have grandchildren as well, uh, Aluna and uh, Oscar, and they're just wonderful little children. So Aluna doesn't like eating breakfast. So she lives in Switzerland. So early in the morning, we have a Zoom call where I eat my breakfast and she eats it at the same time. Wow. So you, when I say I eat, she said, okay, now it's my turn. And that way, that way the breakfast disappears. <laughs> and uh, my younger daughter has worked in teaching and she's doing really well. Yeah. And a perfect human being. So I still remember as a dad, you, you visited and then I remember Anisha's really, I was very protective. And then you said, no, no, it's right, let's day and then put in the walk along the, uh, the Smoky Mountain Rivers. I still remember those experience. And uh, so um, I'm, I actually named Anisha because of Anika. So, oh, right, right. Yeah. So, uh, so that's- uh, Anika and Maya. So Maya. you know what Maya means? 
uh, it's uh, illusion, if I'm yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, oh, well done. It's a word from the Sanskrit, yeah? So she was so, so beautiful that I thought it was an illusion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Annika, of course, um, uh, the inspiration came from Sweden. Okay. You know? So I spent a sabbatical in Sweden with uh, Isab, and there were lots of Annikas, but spelled differently, you know, with a double N, whereas uh, Annika here is a N I K A. So thanks, Harry, for sharing. And that leads to uh, mentoring, okay? So uh, one of the things as a professor, um, one of the worry I always have is probably I'm not doing a good job in mentoring, challenging and providing a caring atmosphere for them to excel. So we might talk about a lot of mentoring style and, in, and also how you enthusiastically share new knowledge and inspiring others to dig deeper as we walk through and kind of give us guidance on, there are three topics I would like you to give guidance. I'll go one by one. One, let's say, who's a budding student who's thinking of embarking on adventures of steel and iron metallurgy. And I took the word from adventures of steel metallurgy from your conference and phase transformation. What would you are um, looking, like kind of, if you have to mentor that budding student, what would that be? Mm -hmm. uh, so this goes back to what I said earlier that the student must have an idea of what they would like to do. And if uh, in particular, you know, there's a very famous uh, book written, uh, which says, uh, how do we create a genius? Okay, you know, like Einstein and so on. And there's a very simple conclusion. If there are a lot of confusing data, that inspires a genius, okay? Whereas if you just jump on to do a PhD in graphene simply because there's a lot of noise about it, that's not a good way to start a PhD program. I, I was invited actually to give a talk at a graphene meeting, a big graphene meeting. And I demonstrated to them that they haven't really achieved anything compared with steel, <laughs> okay? <laughs> it was fun, they appreciated it, okay? So, so, you really, you know, if you really are interested in a PhD, that means a doctor of philosophy where you create new knowledge, you've got to identify an area where there is a lot of confusing information, okay? And in physics, uh, for example, you know, the obvious one would be that gravity and quantum mechanics are not united, you know. Uh, that is the key aspect that I would recommend is to find an area which has significant confusion. That's great. So this going along, I'm moving from a students to the people who are already in the field and contributing. So I, I know we don't have a magical way to look at it, but there is one approach you, uh, is if you can give them a kind of guiding thought process on what should we do as a way of going to the pushing the boundaries to the next level. So I think um, you've got to have a determination uh, and the common saying that it's 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration remains the case, okay? So if you want to do something special as opposed to the run of the male PhD, you have to actually dig really deep. And if there's something you don't understand or you need help with, you find the people who are working on that area and you work and collaborate, for example, not for the sake of collaborating, but because you need to understand. Them. And uh, obviously a PhD is time limited, but if you, if you actually go somewhere towards solving a problem and creating new knowledge, that really inspires, you know. I mean, with neural networks, I've worked for 24 years with David Mackay without any funding, okay? So Harry, this leads to one of the things, some of the conversation we had is a community as a whole. And uh, we should aspire to the future. One of the things I still remember when we, when we thought about having a special conference for you, you indicated that Suresh, we need to think about what is our uh, whole world is going through climate and all other things. 
So like, look at it from our, our own microcosm of metallurgy and steels and everything. What can we do to address some of the challenges we face in the world right now? Yeah. So there are two things uh, which uh, I think are really important, right? One is we need legislation, international legislation, to cut the consumption of steel. Because right now you could cut it, I think, by a factor of uh, a quarter by using better steels, which are somewhat more expensive, okay? So you just look at the example of the aut automobile legislation, and therefore we have much better steels used in smaller quantities, but more expensive. Okay. So steel production, you know, I, I can't remember the figures, but it might be 7% of all the CO2 emissions. And that is not sustainable. You know, we should not be producing 1.6 billion tons of steel every year and consuming it. So coming from a steel person, that sounds crazy, right? But I think if uh, enlightened companies focus on uh, how to reduce CO2 by cutting consumption and by new technologies, and this morning there was a talk given by uh, Surab Kundu in India on exactly the CO2 problem and what they're trying to do with that. Uh, that's one aspect. The second thing is absolutely accurate, and I presented this at a talk in Russia, and the United Nations supports this as well, that we should become vegans. Yeah. The idea of eating meat and milk products and dairy products, it's a secondary production, which results in a huge CO2 cost and methane cost. Overnight, we could meet all the targets if everybody became vegan. So, you know, if you go to Canada, you see vast fields of crops. They're not being grown for human consumption. They're being grown for animal production. So if everyone becomes a vegan or tries to become a vegan, that would make the biggest dent on the environment in the timescales that are necessary. Yeah. Thank you, Ari. That's, that's a good way to project into that. Now, the one of the things which I like to, um, on the steel one, there is, if you go back, uh, you once uh, in our coffee time, we talked about the early steel making. So you, you showed about direct iron reduction. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing that and everything, so is there any way when you're taking that steel to reduce the consumption, is it any way we can do a call, different ways of making the steel, not like an integrated steel making, so that locally we can recycle or even making, can we do locally? Is there any way to think about that way? Yeah, yeah. so steel, steel production um, is the most recycled material in the world actually. And you can't gain much more from recycling because it is recycled so well, okay? But um, the idea of local production, you know, for example, by electrolysis, that only works if you have the electricity to do the job, okay? And you can use the electricity in many ways. You know, you can produce hydrogen and it is possible to do direct reduction or even, even um, put hydrogen in blast furnaces as Saurabh Kundu was talking this morning. So the key is if we have sources of energy, which we can use to cut the CO2 emissions and that's possible. So for example, in 2020, uh, wind turbine power in the UK was so high, the proportion, it was something like 45% that we did not use any coal at all and many gas fired plants were shut down. Yeah. So I think it is possible to produce steel with hydrogen. And in Sweden, they already have a pilot plant or they are building a pilot plant to do exactly that, although the problem of where the hydrogen comes from is not solved. You need to make a start. Uh, now, legislation would help again. Great. Yeah? Because obviously the companies that are investing, you know, they will actually beat everybody else in the future, right? But if there is legislation that really drives innovation,
Thank you, Ari. So that takes to the one of the things like as you are going through from your academic career, professional development, and future projection. So one of the things I still remember is this final question about. Uh, I, I talked about it already. You go very rapidly through the department. You very physically fit. You play squash, and what is your magic? How do you keep uh, winning in the squash and all this? Things? How do you keep it up all the time? I'm... <laughs> so um, it is true that the last set of games I played, I beat uh, Aparo Chinta, who is uh, less than half my age. Okay. Um, but of course, there are many people I'm not able to beat, okay? Um, so I like cycling, uh, long distance cycling. Right now, it, that's not possible simply because of uh, the pandemic. So we're not uh, supposed to go outside of uh, our local areas for exercise. But I bought a, a really nice rowing machine. And every time you row, the water swirls around. So you actually get the feeling of that. And last night, uh, I was uh, doing synchronized rowing over Zoom with okay. a professor of quantum mechanics in our department of applied mathematics and theoretical physics. So it's a lot of fun. You know, it's not simply exercise, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, so one of my regrets in my PhD is I never played squash with you. Uh, I'm going well, to take you know, it there's still time, okay? There's still time to make amends, <laughs> okay? Yeah, so, and, uh, and the only thing I picked up is running. So right now I do that. So uh, anyway, so that, that takes us to the, the last concluding part of that and wrap up in our meeting. So, um, so let me give a little bit up and then I'll open up to you to give more comments also. As I was preparing questions for this interview, um, I still remember our walk and uh, this is personal for me, mainly because after one year, I still remember that I was ready to quit my PhD because I was comparing myself with everybody else. And then you, I still remember your words to me. You said that, Suresh, don't compare your PhD with reference to other, you put your own standards. So you meet up your standards and did you do a good job today? Did you try to move it to that? And those kind of walks, I mean, I'm walking through and I still talk about that in my class about those experiences more than the technical and science inspiration is about that caring nature. And I really like that. And in fact, I'm really happy that you introduced curry lunch in Darwin. I think before right. that, <laughs> and I still remember, I look forward to our curry lunch and then go and have a coffee. I still remember we talked about the controversy of Bainet with another student who works with Professor Aronson. He, I think I forgot his name, it escapes me. I believe we started around 1 p.m. and went on till 3 p.m. I still remember. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones makes up as a research, as a career also. At this time, I take this opportunity to thank uh, on behalf of everybody who have been touched by you. Not only who have uh, talked to you in person, there are a lot of people who follow you and then they quote what you say in many times in their own emails. Many students of the, whom I happen to know, they talk about you. So this is, uh, I'd like to thank you for your caring nature and also enthusiasm and encouragement and also tireless service to community. I, that is one of the hallmark of, as I look at it, it, I look up to you. I wish I could do at least 5% of what you have done. And I look forward to that. And with that, I'll close up and any comments from you, I'll open it up to you. Thank you very much uh, for saying those things, but uh, you know, uh, what is not uh, what is important is that everybody I've worked with are actually doing better than me. Okay, and that's that's the principle: is that your students should actually do better than you. So well done. Okay, and we can stop. Uh, that's great. Thank you. Stop there. <laughs> and thank the AIME also for organizing all this. Thank you, uh, Harry. And this com comes to our conclusion of our uh, Zoom meeting with Professor Harry Badisha. And uh, thanks for the AMA staff for allowing us to share our thoughts and have a dialogue. With that, I will stop this interview.